The Islamic State, ISIS, or Daesh, is only a minor threat to the flow of oil, although their vigorously centralist, anti-capitalist economic management does offer a real ideological opposition to contemporary neoliberalism. But they're most eminently useful as a boogeyman to frighten children and voters. Meanwhile, from drought in Syria to anthrax outbreaks in Arctic Siberia, from flooding in Louisiana to record-breaking heat waves in Kuwait and India, a changing global climate is putting increasing stresses on state and global infrastructure. The sense of imminent, unavoidable collapse these disasters impart combines with an increasingly persuasive Malthusian logic of global scarcity, uh, as we heard in the song, uh, to produce a toxic fog of fear, aggression, and greed, out of which emerge the nationalist, xenophobic, warmongering demagogues currently taking the stage as the aspirant leaders of the world's terrified masses. The post-1945 international order is coming apart, and we seem to lack the kind of leaders, collaborative machinery, and political unity that would be required to keep it together long enough to stop or even slow down our rush off the precipice of carbon dioxide-driven heat death. Oil, of course, is at the center of all this. Burned carbon, burned oil, and coal is what's trapping the heat that's going to melt the ice that will flood our cities. And one of the world's largest sources of that burned carbon is the global network of transportation and production that runs on petroleum. So this is our situation. This is our situation across the planet. But we experience the violence <clears throat> of that world mostly at a distance. Here we are, well-fed, everybody just had lunch, in sunny, beautiful California, and getting all worked up about things happening all across the world, halfway across the world. It's true, people are fighting and dying in ruined cities all over the planet. Old women are bleeding to death in bombed rubble. Children are being murdered, neighbors are killing each other far away and sometimes not so far away. To live in that world is horrific. Noise and danger put every nerve on edge. The only things that matter there are survival, killing the enemy, and having a safe place to sleep. Human life narrows to a cutting edge. I remember living in that world many years ago as a soldier in Baghdad. Today, that world seems impossibly distant, even as it presses in on me every day in a never-ending stream of words, images, appeals, and reports. I see videos, I read stories, I hear talks, I have feelings. I see pictures of this or that injustice, and I'm moved to act, perhaps, but more accurately, to emote, to react, to perform. We don't usually ask where these feelings come from or what they serve, but the cultural technologies transmitting these affective vibrations are not neutral. News outlets shape information to fit their owners' prejudices, while Facebook, Twitter, and Google shape our perceptions through hidden algorithms. Through the specialization and demographic targeting of contemporary media, the tendency is to narrow the channels of perception to the point where we, we receive only those images and vibrations which already harmonize with our own prejudices, our own pre-existing desires, thus intensifying our particular emotional reactions along an increasingly narrow band compelling us to discharge that emotion within the same field of ready listeners, for which we are, will be rewarded with likes and favorites or applause. Our consciousness is shaped daily through feedback systems where some item provokes a feeling, and we discharge that feeling by provoking it in others. We crowdsource our catharsis, creating self-contained wave pools of aggression and fear, pity and terror, stagnant flows that go nowhere and do nothing. Pictures of children killed by bombs or police or pictures of the devastation left in the wake of a tropical storm may move me to sadness and horror. Retransmitting such images will pass along that sadness and horror. My act of transmission will mark me as someone who has feelings about these things and as someone who condemns them, which of course I do. <clears throat> I can rationalize my retransmission by saying that I'm raising awareness or trying to influence public policy. I want my fellow citizens to also be horrified, so perhaps they'll think like I do, or perhaps they'll vote for a representative who works to prevent such horrors from happening, or maybe so that if enough of us all think the same way and feel the same way, the organs and institutions of power will be forced to hear us and align themselves with us, the way that a honeybee colony will pick a new hive 
through the dance of its visionary scouts. <clears throat> that might be an obscure reference. Uh, bees show, bees are, are a democratic animal. They pick new hives, they send out scouts to all these different hives, and the scouts come back and dance. And each scout doing a different dance that describes the hive and where it's at. And more and more of the bees will dance for that, that one particular hive until enough of the bees are all doing one dance and they all fly off, they all fly off for that new hive. Sometimes it happens that uh, two dances are equally as important in that, and what happens then is the hive usually splits and, and one half dies. <clears throat> These are perfectly reasonable human assumptions because that's how physical human collectives function. We're animals. Anyone who's been in a crowd, a sports game, a nightclub, a choir, or a protest knows how bodies resonate together. But politics is the distribution of bodies and systems. And we live in a system of carbon-fueled capitalism that we can't depend on to work this way, especially when it comes to responding to the threat of global warming for a variety of reasons. Our political and social technologies are not neutral, but de developed to serve particular interests, most notably targeted advertising, the concentration of wealth and ideological control. The vibrations that resonate most strongly along these social channels are fear, anger, and mindless pleasure. The more we pass on or react to social vibrations, the more we strengthen our habits of channeling, and the less we practice autonomous reflection or independent critical thought. With every protest chant, we retweet, amen, or, and Facebook post, we become stronger resonators and weaker thinkers. Yet, however intense these vibrations grow, they remain sequestered within machines that offer no political leverage. They do not translate into political action. They don't connect to the flows of power. Finally, while the typical collective human response to collective threat is to name an enemy, pick sides, and mobilize community response, global warming offers no clear enemy. That hasn't stopped people from trying to find one. One climate activist has argued that 90, just 90 companies are responsible for almost two-thirds of all historical greenhouse gas emissions, which may be true, but it also conveniently absolves billions of automobile drivers, airline passengers, meat eaters, and cell phone users of responsibility. The enemy isn't out there somewhere. The enemy is ourselves, not as individuals, but as a collective, as a system, as a hive. How do we stop ourselves from fulfilling our fates as suicidally productive drones in a self-consuming hive? How do we interrupt our perpetual circuits of fear, aggression, crisis, and reaction, these circuits that continually prod us to ever more levels of manic despair? Another way to ask these questions would be to ask what today in this world does peace look like? What does it mean to be for peace? How can we realistically, effectively work for a more peaceful world? Ending war and decarbonizing the global economy are both beautiful, obvious goals, of course. The kind of thing anyone might say, yes, let's do that. Things are rarely so simple, though, and not one of us, not even President Obama or, or the Koch brothers or King Saud, has the power to simply decree such a goal and make it happen. Obama couldn't even manage to close Guantanamo. He, you know... There's, there's constraints on all of us. All of us, however powerful or however disenfranchised, are obliged to negotiate within multi-layered hierarchies of power and a melee of competing interests. So what can we do? What can one person do? What can one organization or institution do? As I argue in Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, the biggest question we face today isn't whether to buy an electric car or decarbonize the global economy. The biggest question we face is how to live meaningfully in how to live many <clears throat> excuse me, how to live meaningful lives in a world undergoing radical change, over which we seem to have little rational control. You've heard the call. We have to do something. We need to fight. We need to identify the enemy and go after them. Some respond, march, chant for revolution. Some look away, deny what's happening, and search out escape routes into imaginary tomorrows, a life off the grid, space colonies, or consumer satiety in a wireless, robot-staffed, 3D-printed techno-utopia. Meanwhile, the rich take shelter in their fortresses, trusting to their air-conditioning private schools and well-paid private guards. 
Fight, flight, flight, fight. The threat of death activates our deepest animal drives. Sociologist Tom Pratsky writes, people will do almost anything to avoid being afraid. When, despite their best efforts, fear and anxiety do break through, people go to incredible lengths to shut them down. Sometimes when these vibrations shake us, we discharge them by passing them on, retweeting the story, reposting the video, hoping that others will validate our reaction, thus assuaging our fear by assuring ourselves that collective attention has been alerted to the threat. Other times, we react with aversion, working to dampen the vibrations by searching out positive reinforcements, pleasurable images and videos, something funny, something, anything to ease the fear. We buy something, we eat food, we pop a pill, we fuck. And either passing on the vibration or reacting against it, we let the fear short circuit our own autonomous desires, diverting us from our goals and loading ever more emotional static into our daily cognitive processing. We become increasingly distracted from our ambitions and increasingly susceptible to such distraction. And whether we retransmit or react, we reinforce channels of thought, perception, behavior, and emotion that, over time, come to shape our habits and our personality. As we train ourselves to resonate fear and aggression, we reinforce patterns of thought and feeling that shape a society that breeds the same. The human psyche naturally rebels against the idea of its end. Likewise, civilizations have throughout history marched blindly toward disaster because humans are wired to believe that tomorrow will be much like today. It's hard work for us to remember that this way of life, this present moment, this order of things is not stable or permanent. Across the world today, our actions testify to our belief that we can go on like we are forever, burning oil, poisoning the seas, killing off other species, pumping carbon into the air, ignoring the ominous silence of our coal mine canaries in favor of the unending robotic tweets of our new digital imaginarium. <clears throat> Yet the reality of global climate change is going to keep intruding on our collective fantasies of perpetual growth, constant innovation, and endless energy, just as the reality of individual mortality shocks our casual faith in permanence. The greatest challenge that climate change poses isn't how the Department of Defense should plan for resource wars, whether we should put up seawalls to protect Manhattan or when we should abandon Miami. It won't be addressed by buying a Prius, turning off the air conditioning, signing a treaty, or even voting. The greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, an existential one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with mortal humility, kindness, and compassion to our new reality. Thank you. Get a little technological help from my friend Robin. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I'm Antonia Yuhas. Um, in addition to my uh, long bio that you've all got in your books, um, I also am on the National Advisory Committee of Iraq Veterans Against the War. So shout out to IVAW. <laughs> um, and I'm going to wait till my, there we go, it'll just take a sec. So I want to start um, by welcoming to you to Refugee Camp BP. This is a refugee camp that I visited in May in Greece, right at the border with Macedonia. And you can go to the next one, Robin. Um, these are primarily refugees in this camp um, from Iraq and Syria, but the majority of uh, refugees are from Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. And um, what you'll see in the pictures is representative of the majority of refugees in Greece now, which is that 70% are women and children. So you'll see a lot of um, children and women in these pictures. And this was an impromptu refugee camp set up uh, with refugees trying to get through um, across the border into Macedonia. And of course, 
the borders came down and they were stuck. And they set up their camp on top of a BP gas station. And it's known, um, go ahead, among um, the, both the people who live there and the volunteers who support it as refugee camp BP. Um, so this is the camp in the distance, and here's the gas station. You can keep going. And one more. And we'll stop there for a moment. So um, I've spent the better part of probably two decades um, trying to untangle the relationship of oil and war. But one of the things that's happened over those two decades is um, a, a deeper entangling with three sets of problems, which is um, the oil industry needing to push farther to get oil. It's becoming more difficult to get oil. The oil that's left in the world is mostly spoken for. It's owned by governments, or it's in increasingly difficult places to reach. So deep, deep, deep underwater, you have to frack to get at it. You have to fight a war to acquire it. And at that same, during that same period of time, the impacts of our consumption of oil and fossil fuels has led to an ever damaging corruption of our climate. So most people who work on this call it climate chaos, extremes of weather as a result of our oil consumption. But the more and more we get entangled with oil, the more power we've also given to the industry, the more control it has exercised over our ability to make individual decisions that move us off of oil, the further extremes we've gone to meet its ends and the increasing consequences of climate, and there's this churning of climate or oil. But I don't think in any period in my two decades, and I've traveled to a lot of places studying oil from the bottom of the ocean to uh, Afghanistan and many places in between, um, have I seen such an um, extreme vision of the consequences of this uh, cycle as refugee camp BP. So these are, um, as I was saying, refugees from Syria and Iraq in particular stuck on top of a BP gas station trying to get free. And if there's any um, embodiment of winners of the Iraq war, and there are winners of the Iraq war, which has of course pushed into the war in Syria, the winners our BP is certainly high on that list. The list also includes BP, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, ConocoPhillips, Halliburton. If there are losers, not losers as people, but people who have lost the most as a result of these wars, it's certainly embodied in these individuals who have lost everything, have nothing to go back to and now nowhere to go and are stuck on top of a gas station. Um, also, though, this embodies why they can't go back, which is the continuation of this conflict and war, which is driven, continues to be driven by oil and continues to be driven by climate change. So um, if you can go to the next slide, Robin. So I've written a lot on these issues, and so I, don't, I won't go into detail because there isn't a lot of time. I've done a lot of the background writing on the role of um, corporations in the decision-making leading up to and then um, uh, the outcome of the Iraq war in my book, The Bush Agenda, which is why I brought a couple copies uh, uh, with that with me today. Um, and I think though I did the best like short version in this CNN piece that I wrote. Um, and this is, in this article I make clear, I didn't write the headline. Good thing to note, if you ever read articles, the person who writes the article almost never writes the headline. Um, the headline is, is more extreme than the article. I never argue that the only reason why we fought the war in Iraq is oil, but certainly it's a key uh, objective. And the way to test that is in the outcomes. So the outcomes were, prior to the invasion of Iraq, all the Western oil companies were shut out of Iraq's oil. Following the invasion, the U.S. government, together with oil companies, rewrote Iraq's laws to open up Iraq to foreign oil companies under the terms that they set. And then in came Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, Total, ConocoPhillips. And now they're all sitting on the largest oil fields in the world 
pumping oil from the largest oil fields in the world, including from northern Iraq, and a lot of their bases are in Erbil, and that's going to be important. Um, I would argue, though, that there have been times when the United States has gone to war to ensure a flow of oil to the United States or a secure source of oil for the United States. That wasn't the case at this stage with the Iraq war. The Iraq war was about, in terms of oil, um, was about a couple things. One is, you know, denying the power of that oil to someone who had emerged as our enemy, um, denying the power of that resource to people we don't like. But it was to put it in the hands of oil companies. It was their interests that were being served. And there's no, um, th there's nothing that says that if Exxon has access to Iraq's oil that the United States therefore is going to benefit from that oil. There's no relationship there. What the relationship there is, is that Exxon will benefit and Chevron will benefit and ConocoPhillips will benefit and they will give the money from that benefit to support the candidates who they like. And 99.5% of the time that is Republicans and in particular in this case it was the Bush and Cheney administration and that administration was serving their interests and their interests were very well served and just this week they re-signed um, their major contracts in Iraq, continuing that control. Now, um, I think go to the next one. I'm not sure what order I put these in. Yeah, so then just real quick. Um, so we all know um, the roots of, uh, Islam, is, of Islamic State are Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was formed in 2004 in opposition to the U.S. and coalition forces. Um, many Iraqis were pissed off that we had occupied Iraq, one of the reasons being a clear understanding and belief that one of the goals of that war was to acquire or take control over Iraq's oil, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and then Islamic, then uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq changes its name to Islamic State. If you want to form a state, well, pretty much anywhere in the world, but particularly in the Middle East, you do that by acquiring oil. And that's the first thing that Islamic State set out to do and moved into Syria and essentially took over Syrian oil fields, refining, and distribution. And that remains its primary source of income. It then moved into Iraq and took some smaller oil fields in Iraq. And that wealth supports Islamic State. And obviously that activity created enormous amounts of, of instability in Syria, driving further conflict in Syria and driving further conflict in Iraq. But the Obama administration did not enter militarily in a you know, full military, um, its biggest military activity upon taking power in Iraq was in response to a threat that Islamic State faced to oil, our oil interests. It was when Islamic State challenged the Kirkuk oil field, one of the largest oil fields in the world, and threatened Erbil. When that happened, that is when we responded militarily. And that was one of the, one of the factors that kept us going and engaged and making Iraq a place where people can't live, making Syria a place where people can't live and flee from. Um, also, just to note this one, most recently after the terror attacks in Paris, when there was a response, a military response to those terror attacks. The very first strike zone was the Syrian oil fields to try and take those back from Islamic State. Uh, next one. So that's one piece, um, is the role that we, the fighting over oil, right? But of course, this really critical secondary piece is that our addiction to fossil fuels, our consumption of fossil fuels is intensifying climate change. And climate change is creating its own conflicts. And this is just one, I think, really telling slide on that front. It's just, just 2012 alone. And this is the more than th 32 million people in the world in that year who were displaced due to extreme weather. And that means you leave your home. And what this most often is the long-term displacement is really most often caused by heat and drought. So much of the world is still rural and lives off of agriculture, so you can no longer farm. 
you have to go somewhere else. You go into a city that's already strained, already dealing with its own conflicts, already dealing with its own resource struggles. And now you have a mass influx of people. And that creates further instability. And then you often have to leave your country altogether. And this is very much a story about what happened, part of what also happened in Syria. Extreme drought in Syria pushed people out of the rural areas. They couldn't farm anymore. They went to cities that added to already existing tensions and struggles in the cities that exacerbated the war. And it forced even more refugees to flee Syria and become the refugees that we saw. Um, that, um, that is only going, to, only going to become worse. Next one. Um, I just threw, threw this in really quick because um, I think a lot of you have probably heard about this latest issue with ExxonMobil and it's, it was, it's being referred to as Exxon New, Exxon Mobil's, uh, the evidence that Exxon Mobil denied climate science that it itself learned in the 70s. Um, are people familiar with this? Okay. Um, so one of the um, consequences of our going to extremes to satisfy the interests of the oil industry is that that also builds up the wealth of the oil industry, which also gives it more influence over policy decisions. So our ability to deal with climate change as a societal issue, our awareness of the issue, the policy tools that were made available to us were deeply, deeply constrained by 30 years of ExxonMobil using its vast sums of wealth to build up the opposite, right? To build up the argument that there's no such thing as climate change, um, and to literally remove policies that were being, to rewrite policy within the Bush administration to eliminate policies that were being designed to look at climate change from previous administrations and to literally write them out of legislation um, within the Bush administration and to write them out of policy within the Bush administration and to set us back decades in, um, knowledge that was available to us and actions and actual policy that was available to us. And because the oil industry has also been um, suffering a, a victim of its own um, wealth, the victim of, of its own success, uh, because we let the industry go anywhere and everywhere it wanted to go to the deepest depths of the ocean into fracking fields fighting wars for it, there is an, a surplus of oil, and that is one of the reasons, although not the only reason, for the price of oil and gasoline dropping so uh, dramatically and that reducing the wealth of the oil industry. That's led some people within our movements to say, um, well, the oil industry is over. We don't need to worry about the industry anymore. And I just want to put that into perspective. We have had significant success in tackling the oil industry, and one of the reasons why is that it's fighting so many battles right now because of its weakening um, uh, profits and revenues that it's bringing in because of the fall of the price of oil and gasoline, that it's weaker than it's been and more susceptible to, our, to, to organizing and activism. But I just want to make sure we remember what the wealth is that we're talking about we're talking about this industry because there really are almost no other parallels. The banking industry is one, and now sort of out of nowhere in the last couple of years, tech is the other. Um, but in, in one of the worst years in 20 years, which was 2015, we're still talking about $260 billion in revenue for ExxonMobil. That's larger than most of the economies on the entire planet, right? And this was a really, really bad year. Um, go to the next one. And then I think most importantly is looking at their profits because that's the money that they have to work to influence policy with. And again, in a really, really, really bad year, ExxonMobil last year had $16 billion in profits. This isn't to, um, this is, isn't to turn you off from organizing around those, these companies, it's to turn you on to it. Um, because it, it just is to put to rest the idea that all we have to do is sneeze and the oil industry will go away, uh, which is seems to be percolating a lot. And that's not the case. It's going to take organizing and it's going to keep, take, keep doing what a lot of people are already doing. Okay, the next one. Um, so just really quick, and um, when the changes that were put in place in Iraq in terms of its oil laws 
were also put in place in Afghanistan and successfully put in place in Afghanistan. And this is a photo that I took. Um, this is on top of natural gas fields um, in Afghanistan. And the only difference in Afghanistan is that one, there obviously isn't nearly as much oil or natural gas wealth, so it's not as great of a draw, but it does have oil and it does have natural gas. So the United States figured, what the hell, as long as we've invaded, let's rewrite the laws, and we did very successfully. Um, the oil industry was not interested in coming in, mostly because there was not nearly the stability and not nearly the wealth. But just so we know, the laws were changed. Those same laws, by the way, were just changed in Iran. As part of the negotiations um, on the nuclear deal, Iran is trying to re-enter the international oil market. To do so, it agreed to fund basically fundamentally the same set of rewrites that happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and now Iran, opening it up to foreign oil companies really on their terms. So then, you know, what, what we do about these problems, and I just am throwing this out there to throw it out there. Um, one, one, one uh, these are the burning oil fields of Kuwait in 1991. And this is what it looked like. And uh, next slide. So this is what um, Donald Trump has said about Islamic State. I would. I'd bomb the hell out of the oil fields in terms of how do you deal with Islamic State, knowing that Islamic State controls a lot of oil. I'd bomb the hell out of the oil fields. I'd then get Exxon. Um, I'd get these great oil companies to go in. They would rebuild them so fast your head would spin. Asked if you need U.S. troops to protect the oil companies, specifically, Trump said, yes. You put a ring around them, meaning troops around the oil companies. You put a ring. Next one. And to just point out sort of where the place where we're at, the oil industry. In the future, you are going to need every molecule of oil that you can get from every source. Defenders of wildlife. You have to kill people, kill wildlife, and kill the last wild places to get what's left of the world's oil. But the good news, this is an issue about which people care desperately, both peace and climate change. But the awareness about climate change is increasing dramatically. And as you can see from this chart, this is Americans' preferred solution to our energy problems, emphasizing the production of oil and gas, which is the bottom one, emphasizing alternative energy is the top one. 73% of Americans, 73% of Americans don't agree on many things. Um, and that's just to, to address, to embrace alternative energy and to reject fossil fuels. This is a very strong sentiment, go to the next one, and it's true among both Democrats and Republicans. So for the first time, a majority of Republicans now hold this view as well, 51%. That's a huge change, almost 90% of Democrats. Next one. And this is part of a movement. So I believe very strongly that what we have to do is organize so that we have a capacity to make individual decisions that change the course of what's happening. So when we can change the public policy platform, for example, that provides us with the opportunity to pay, take public transportation instead of having to drive an individual car, that's a policy change that we can control. A policy change that says we reject the use of the military to uh, secure resources for oil companies or even to get oil is a policy decision that we can uh, influence. And there are mass people organizing on these issues in greater numbers than have ever organized before. This is from Paris. Um, I believe, uh, and I wrote a, an article that was called um, Paris is a way station in the climate change fight. So the Paris Climate Accord had some very significant problems. It had some advantages, but what it mostly was was a, a point of organizing and transition within um, building a much broader and active and collective climate change movement because it brought people together from all around the world. And that was in Paris. And this message of leave it in the ground has become the dominant message. Um, the next slide. 
Um, this is the um, grassroots, grassroots global justice delegation in Paris. Um, people um, from the United States impacted by extremes of climate change, organizing and mobilizing with other frontline communities and other impacted people in Paris. Um, they were really um, jazzed by the experience of the organizing that they experienced there um, and brought that home. Next one. And then that went from marching to a series of coordinated direct actions targeting fossil fuel production all around the world. So there were actions simultaneous on one day all around the world. There were more than I could count. Um, this was one action. This is a massive coal digger at a coal field. The white dots are people who have shut down the coal digger. And the message is keep it in the ground. These direct actions happened and shut down points of production, transport, um, refining, um, uh, I think that's everything, yeah. Um, and the next one. And so this message of keep it in the ground actually originated, some people say in Nigeria, some people say in Ecuador, um, around the 70s and 80s and really coalesced in the 90s. And the message is just because we have fossil fuels doesn't mean we need to use them and that we can choose to leave them in the ground. And we can organize to achieve that and support in particular frontline communities that are struggling to make that happen where they live. And in the era of climate change, as we heard, we're all a frontline community. And uh, we can all see ourselves linked in that way and to uh, support this call and then do what we can to see that uh, take root in our own lives. So thank you very much. Michael's running to the lights. So good to be here. Thank all of you um, uh, for being here. I kept, you know, I'm an old 60s activist person. I kept saying this. It really feels like teaching in, um, in the universities in the 1960s. It's just very, it, just the energy in the room. So thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I have to do this little leaning thing like the others. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really honored to uh, be invited to speak at a Veterans for Peace um, convention and um, uh, honored to be with uh, these two wonderful panelists who've given, you, given us so much uh, substantive um, material. Antonia is my source for everything catching up on uh, the research she does is incredible. You know, do follow her work and buy her book. Uh, and I want to um, acknowledge that we're on um, Ohlone Nation uh, territory. So, yes. So I want to talk about um, an alternate reality that has existed in the past and the core and strands of which continue right here in North America. And being a historian, I need to take us back to the beginning of human civilization. We'll get through it pretty quickly though. <laughs> Pre-colonial indigenous Americans were able to support complex societies with extensive agriculture as well as building large cities and towns. However, in every instance, when these civilizations grew to the point of depleting resources and producing autocratic governance, they decentralized. What charlatans like Jared Diamond see as collapse and historians see as rise and fall of civilizations, I see choices being made. And this is where we are right now, having to find a way to make some choices. One key element was missing before 1492 as the metaphorical date, 
of the rise of capitalism. And only in Europe did this social condition exist that would give rise to it. It is amazing how many better choices can be made without the profit motive and with reverence for survival of the collective. The colonial myth of a sparse population of Neolithic hunters and gatherers in Amazonia and the Arctic regions and seacoasts has long masked the reality of the pre-colonial Western Hemisphere, in which the indigenous peoples had built economies and institutions that supported populations as large as Europe at the time, but without the motive of profit and accumulation of individual and corporate wealth. Capitalist accumulation and private property were not inevitable developments of human societies as the Western idea of progress argues. Nor is Tina, there is no alternative to capitalism, true. It's a necessity that there is an alternative to capitalism or we're doomed. The necessary change that is required for survival of life on this planet will take more than sustainable development and an end to fossil fuels although both are absolutely necessary. It will require a radically different relationship of human beings to one another and to the land and to all other animals and creatures and to the universe. Outer space is being colonized too and polluted. As food sovereignty theorists Sam Gray and Raj Patel write about Native Americans' relationship to the land, given the kin-like relationship to the land, it is more accurate to understand its commodification made into real estate, bought and sold, not as a deepening reification, but as enslavement. Just as people have a right to their land, the land has a right to its people. This is the logical terminus of a line of thinking that begins with the idea of the cosmos as a living entity, not resources to be consumed. There are serious misunderstandings and politicized scientism about pre-colonial Western Hemisphere civilizations that preceded European colonization, which prevent us from learning about the special relations the special social relations and economies of those civilizations and the indigenous knowledge systems that still exist today. As a birthplace of agriculture and the towns and cities that followed, the Western Hemisphere is ancient, not a new world. Domestication of plants took place around the globe in seven locales during approximately the same period around 10,000 years ago. Three of the seven birthplaces of agricultural civilization were located in the Western Hemisphere, all based on corn. These were the Valley of Mexico and Central America or Mesoamerica, the South Central Andes in South America, and the entire Eastern half of North America. The other early agricultural centers were the ones we do learn about in the second grade, Tigris, Euphrates, and Nile system, sub-Saharan Africa, the Yellow River of northern China, and the Yantes River of southern China. During this period of development 10,000 years ago, many of the same human societies began domesticating animals. Only in the Western Hemisphere was the parallel domestication of animals eschewed in favor of game management, a kind of animal husbandry different from that developed in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And this is perhaps a significant difference that we need to think about. And the term hunter is a European concept that is not accurate to apply to native animal husbandry. They brought the animals, attracted the animals to game parks that they built. 
uh, but they lived in the wild, and they were food. Indigenous American agriculture was based on corn. Traces of cultivated corn have been identified in central Mexico dating back about uh, 2,000 years. 12 to 14 centuries later, corn production had spread throughout the temperate and tropical American uh, continents from the southern tip of South America to the subarctic of North America and from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean on both continents. The wild grain from which corn was cultivated has never been identified with certainty. There is no such thing as wild corn, like wild wheat, wild barley, wild almost everything. Since there is no evidence of corn on any other continent prior to its post-Columbus dispersal of Western Hemisphere products, the development of corn is a unique invention of the original American agriculturalists. Unlike most grains, corn cannot grow wild and cannot exist without attentive human care. Along with multiple varieties and colors of corn, some 95 or so, each with different nutrient values. Mesoamericans cultivated many colors and kinds and sizes of squash and beans. These were the three sisters, which were extended throughout the hemisphere, as were the many varieties and colors of potato cultivated by the Andean farmers beginning more than 7,000 years ago at 16,000 feet elevation. Thanks to the nutritious triad of corn, beans, and squash, which provide a complete protein, the Americas were densely populated when the European monarchies began sponsoring colonization projects here. Theft of ind indigenous, um, indigenous land and food crops was a primary method of British, then United States colonial occupation and ethnic cleansing to make way for monocrop production, agriculture, mostly non-food crops. That was the beginning of industrial agriculture and the basis of US capitalism. The total population of the hemisphere was about 100 million at the end of the 15th century, with about two-fifths in North America, including Mexico. Central Mexico alone supported 30 million people Experts who acknowledge this and know it, and only experts seem to know it and doesn't get out into the textbooks, uh, have observed that such population densities in pre-colonial America were supportable because the peoples had created a relatively disease-free paradise. That's a quote uh, that's often used. But that's not really true if they've done any research. There were diseases. It was bubonic plague um, in the Southwest. It was gonorrhea. There were, you know, there were diseases. They're human beings. And there were health problems. But the practice of herbal medicine and even surgery and dentistry, and most importantly, both hygienic and ritual bathing, which Europeans didn't do, kept diseases at bay. Ritual sweat baths were common to all Native North Americans and South Americans having originated like most everything from these civilizations in Mexico. Too often we place blame for ecological destruction on the very existence of human beings and human societies. But this self-hate is toxic, and it is self-hate. The problem is capitalism, which is not the same as commerce and trade and lives well lived. And capitalism emerged with military invasions and conquests of the people's land and resources of the Western Hemisphere, spread to the rest of the non-European world, and they continue today, led by the United States. Nearly three centuries of rapacious and militarized European exploitation and genocide in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and the Americas culminated in the birth of the United States as the first state founded as a capitalist state. And that capitalist economy was born in the cotton kingdom 
in the 1820s based on stolen land and enslaved African bodies, not just the labor, their bodies, as commodities bought and sold, accumulating capital. In this US system, unique among colonial powers, land became and remains the most important exchange commodity for the continued accumulation of capital. And when I say land, I mean all of the resources in it or on it. To understand the genocidal policy of the US government, the centrality of land sales in the building, the economic base of US wealth and power must be seen. So war and the economy have been inseparable from day one of the United States of America. This is also the source and character of the U.S. military. As Air Force officer and military historian uh, John Grenier writes, in our military heritage, U.S. Americans depended on raising and destroying enemy villages and, fr and, and fields, that means native people, killing enemy women and children, raiding settlements for captives, intimidating and brutalizing enemy non-combatants, and assassinating enemy leaders. In the wars against native nations between 1607 and 1814, Americans forged two elements, unlimited war and a regular war, into their first way of war that is still the core and a heart of the US military. In cases where a rough balance of power existed, Grenier observes, or if the Indians even appeared dominant, as with a, was a situation in virtually every frontier war until the first decade of the, uh, of the 19th century, Americans were quick to turn to extravagant violence, a prefigured pattern, Grenier calls it, of US annexation and colonization of indigenous nations across the continent for the following centuries. A vanguard of farmer settlers led by seasoned Indian fighters calling on authorities and militias of the British colonies first and the US Army later to defend their illegal settlements, forming the core of the US, uh, the core dynamic of United States democracy and patriotism. And this is John Grenier's um, uh, point of this book, The First, uh, the, um, first Way of War, John Grenier's uh, um, book, American War Making on the Frontier, 1607 to 1814, which he wrote to show the use of special forces and rangers in the world today as a direct descendant of uh, the Indian Wars. So uh, this is the military that's loose on the world today, and it's got to be stopped. U.S. power, and as importantly, U.S. patriotism is maintained through this regeneration through violence. Okay, thank you very much for those great presentations, very informative, and I'm sure the uh, audience has a number of questions. Um, I, I have one for Roy though, first. Um, when you say a civilization is dead, this civilization is dead, can you, can you talk about what that means? I, I know it's in your book, but right. don't say read the book. <laughs> So the, I'm, I'm talking about carb, specifically carbon-fueled global capitalism. Uh, the, the world, uh, you know, basically that, that began in the 
late 18th, early 19th century, and really, um, really took the shape that it is now in only in the past 60, 70 years. Uh, people talk about this period uh, from the 40s on as this great acceleration in all kinds of things, uh, energy consumption, uh, you know, the amount of pavement uh, in the world, um, the global population, um, and it, just this massive building, um, massive human growth all over the world. Uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That form of life, uh, one way of life among, among many, uh, among many forms of life that humans have had in the world and, and built, that I don't believe is going to survive. I think it's already dead. And more to the point, whether or not it's like factually true, whether it's I mean, obviously we're still here, right? We're all in this building with the lights and the that go on and off and, and everything. But <laughs> but I, I'm also I'm making that argument that to say that it's already dead, um, to as a as an end run around uh, the the problem of of fear that comes up when we want to when we know, realize that it's going away and we want to save it, people want to save it, they, they want to make America great again or whatever, and, and we, we're not, that's not going to happen. Or, or you know, and, and the cost, yeah, the costs there are, are way too high. So it's, it's a way around that, it's, it's a trying to find a way around that dynamic um, by accepting it from the beginning. Great, and that makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> and I, I believe that we all believe that. That's why we're here, because we're trying to create that new world. Um, with this one being dead, we, we know we need to create a new one, so that's good. Can I have a round of applause for that, if you don't mind? <laughs> all right. Uh, so now, let me see some hands, and the first person I'm gonna speak to is gonna be a woman. So actually, you men could even put your hands down until, unless no woman, okay, so. You stand up and uh, state your name. And it's a question, it is not a statement. Oh, Jane Stillwater, I was very interested in what you were saying about, you know, kind of like our self-indulgence with Twitter and Facebook and, and that that wasn't the answer to the problem. And you seem to hint an answer. Do we have to buy your book in order to find out what it is? <laughs> or can you spill it down in less than five minutes? Thanks. Yes, you have to buy the book. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it, it's more, it's, I, I don't think there are answers to being human in the world um, and, or the, the, the world we live in. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, there aren't answers. There are just better ways of asking questions and better ways of trying to organize our, our lives. Okay? Yeah. I think one point that's always important to remember about Facebook and Twitter is, and we think of them as such, um, you know, places of, of free communication is that they're controlled by corporations that have very clear agendas for the way that we use them and to be always reminded of that. It seems like environmentalism is starting to really hit the masses in this country and certainly in, in Western Europe, but what is happening in concern for the environment uh, in, say, major countries of South America, particularly Brazil and China and Russia? I can answer. Um, there's uh, major uh, organizing and concern around the environment and climate everywhere in the world. Um, there are also, there are definitely differences on freedom to express that and freedom to, to see it expressed, but definitely um, all over the world and some of the greatest movements are in countries that you've named. One of the challenges facing um, Brazil, Ecuador, Venezuela, um, who am I forgetting, uh, is a strong push right now um, to did I say Bolivia? Bolivia. To um, use 
fossil fuel extraction, oil and natural gas, as a means of acquiring the income with which to spread um, wealth, but to increasingly intensify that use of fossil fuels. And so that's running extremely counter to the views of many um, indigenous and social movements within those countries that are fighting very hard for the opposite, and in many cases um, to, to bloody results. Um, and that there's a strong ask among those communities that there, there, there is global support um, uh, for those efforts, but also that you know, basically, if we're going to say to countries, um, we don't want you to use fossil fuels, that there are alternative economics, uh, alternative economic opportunities that are presented at the same time. And a really important case study, um, I wrote a piece about this, is on the Yasuni National Forest in Ecuador, um, which is one of the most important national forests in the world, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet, um, has the highest concentration of insects and trees and, than anywhere else on the planet, which I can personally attest to the insect part, um, <laughs> but also has um, the three only remaining um, non-contacted tribes that live in um, Ecuador, so they've not had any contact with the outside world. Um, there also is a lot of oil there. And the president of Ecuador, Correa, had said to the world, if you don't want me to drill in Yasuni, then you pay me to keep the oil in the ground. And it was a brilliant idea. The United Nations set up basically a trust fund where money could go into the trust fund. It would go, then go into alternative energy and other modes of development in Ecuador. Um, there's lots of reasons why it failed, but it failed. And then that idea basically got dusted with that one failure. But the idea that we have to create alternative economic measures to support a rejection of fossil fuels, I think is an important one to continue with. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that we always have to keep in mind, like these countries, this is Amazon, the Amazonian part of, of those, all those countries, that we also have to keep in mind that the United States is working every single day to try to overthrow the progressive governments that have gotten elected there. They used to keep generals in power simply torturing and disappearing people. Now they, they organize mobs of people, you know, orange revolutions and green, you know, all colors, and uh, seemingly in, in support of opposition to, so these oppositions we should never take we have to be careful as North Americans to always remember what our government is doing in these countries. And any time we talk about South America or Underdell or Africa or other countries, we have to talk about AFRICOM. We have to talk about uh, the uh, uh, US in everywhere, everywhere in the world, in Colombia, crawling, you know, special forces for the last 40 years. So I just want to make that as a reminder that, of course, I, I support these struggles. I do work at the UN, the indigenous peoples, but they're quite aware. You know, they're also quite aware, but there are a lot of US NGOs that go down there. And I think innocently, I don't think they're paid by the CIA like they used to be in, in the 60s, but they're naive and they think they're helping these people by condemning the very governments that the U.S. is trying to overthrow. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what do you, what would you say about the career and martyrdom of Berta Cáceres in uh, Honduras recently and the work that she did with her organization, the Victories? Um, so, um, 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 Berta was part of a very active um, and um, effective environmental movement and human rights movement intimately intertwined in Honduras, um, trying to link uh, human rights abuses, state abuse, environmental abuse, and being very effective in that organizing and part of a very large and broad network. Um, she was assassinated, others with her have been assassinated. Um, the last several years actually have been the most deadly for environmental organizers in the world um, of any other uh, set of years. <laughs> um, but that also is true um, 
ah for journalists right now um and there's been a link between sort of frontline murder of frontline activists um and those covering frontline activists and trying to um carry their message. um i would say the one and this is obviously a a horribly tragic outcome um berta's family has been very active in continuing her organizing and continuing her messages um and her daughters have been very active and people that they touched and she has touched and that organizing continues and i did not know her personally but those i know who did know her personally i think the most important thing they would say if um is to contribute money and resources and support to those who continue that organizing because um berta's murder did not stop organizing it you know she had laid many 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 seeds that continue to grow that now even more so need our support but there might be others who are far more familiar with her and the situations in Honduras than I am. Well, it, we have to mention the coup, which I think you uh, you all probably know about. The the coup that happened like four months after Obama went into office and Hillary Clinton was his uh, Secretary of State. Um, and this Lenny, uh, Lenny, what's his last name? Lenny, her, this advisor, Lenny something. Huh? Yeah, Lenny Davis. Okay, he's a lawyer for the coup makers, and he's the you know Clinton friend. And uh, I think Bom- Obama just didn't know the situation at all, and they just rushed it through, and they immediately recognized the coup government. This overthrew Zelaya, President Zelaya, who was he's a wealthy rancher, but he was for the people. He wasn't like Trump, you know. He he was a really amazing, uh, popular. A uh, person who understood the indigenous issues, the African, Afro-Caribbean issues, the Garifuno, uh, and wanted to get rid of those bases. Their bases all over. We used to call Honduras a um, a stationary submarine. You know when they were running the Contra war out of there. But it's even worse. And and so he was overthrown. And and it has unleashed this violence from this regime, and the military and privateers that is beyond this all these children that came up unaccompanied these were war refugees from a civil war um they were almost all hondurans and it is it's almost an unlivable situation uh there and we really there was almost no protest at the time uh we, we have to keep an eye on on what the united states is doing and and you know publicize it and outlaw it not just the drone warfare, but everywhere where they are. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm sorry. We don't really have time for any more questions. We're going to have to end because we have a workshop starting. And also, we want to take this picture um, that for the Agent Orange and Responsibility Relief Campaign. So the idea is, well, first, let me give a big round of applause to the... <laughs> Very good panel.